for this next hour, we're going to do a little bit of a dive into the components of a high energy system. And uh, I understand you've covered some of this, but I was asked to go a little bit more, kind of sharing some of our lessons that we've learned over the years. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, as I call it, the spinning rust. All alternators, an overview. <coughs> so this goes back into a little bit of history. And I'm seeing some people out there that might understand some of this. If you've ever seen a generator or a dynamo, and uh, if you understand the difference, uh, there was, ah, uh, how do I want to say this? As time moves on, there's often something that forces a change. And we're focused on the DC systems here. So in the 50s, that thing that focused a change was increased electrical demands. People wanted not just headlights in their car, they wanted two headlights. They wanted a radio. They wanted a heater. They wanted a heater with a fan. Good Lord. They wanted all of this electrical gear in these fancy new cars. And the DC generators, which actually made DC, and we can talk about offline the difference of how it did it, they weren't up to the, 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 the task. They could not scale large enough to make 20, 30 amps. They just couldn't do it. That was kind of their high water mark. So the auto industry, being clever people, said, let's figure a different way. Alternators. An alternator is actually an AC generator. It's an AC head. Alternator consists of the stator. That's the thing that produces the power. It produces AC power. It then goes into the diode pack, which rectifies it into DC, which gets, gets squirted out to your trip hazard get squared out to your battery. <sighs> These fancy things. I like to walk, but thank you. <laughs> um, and then the way, the way you control it is there's a rotor, and that's actually an electromagnet. And that rotor has got the field in it, and that is controlled by the regulator, which in this case is here, and how hard you drive that electromagnet, how hard you drive the field, combined with how fast the alternator is spinning, determines how much power comes out of the alternator. That's just fundamentally how they work. Uh, when we look at from a modeling standpoint, we actually look at these things as mechanically driven current amplifiers. We put in a certain amount of current into the field. There is a multiplication factor that is variable depending on how fast the engine is going, and that's how much current you get out the back end. And those of you who all know Ohm's Law, there is a relationships between voltage and current, but when we're looking at these things from a modeling and simulation standpoint, they're actually modeled as a mechanically driven current amplifier. Okay. Um, by the way, in case you're all wondering if you've ever had tack driven off the alternator, that is sensing the stator. It's sensing the AC waveform before the diodes. That's why it's called the stator tap. And they're looking at the frequency of that AC because we're not at a fixed frequency. We don't have to make 60 hertz. We vary the engine speed up and down so you get a variable frequency. That's how those uh, TAC connected alternators work. Or, uh, sorry, alternator connected tachometers work. Which, by the way, and I'm sure everyone knows this, is why the customer complaint, my batteries are full and my tack stopped working. What's wrong? You don't need any output of the alternator. You're not putting any input into it. You're not getting any AC waveform and your tack just stops working. All right. Um, here is a bit more detail. I've already covered a lot of this. This is an example of what would be inside many alternators. You've got the stator and the rotor. You've got slip rings. And the cool thing about this, and this is the biggest differentiator between a DC generator or dynamo and an alternator. This is a fairly low current path. With the DC generator, they actually rectified using slip rings, and they had to run that 20 or 30 amps through the slip rings, and that was a limiting factor. You just couldn't do it reliably. 
So in this case, when you see the rings, they're actually driving the rotor, fairly low current, maybe two to four amps, depending on your alternator. We've had some that are, are uh, as high as 20 amps, I think, but <clears throat> that particular alternator weighed about 600 pounds and it had an inch and three quarter inch shaft that uh, got twisted off during operations. And I'll be happy to cover that little story at time if we have opportunity. Voltage regulators, most alternators, we have to remember this, most alternators are made for the auto industry. The auto industry, all they gotta do is supply a little bit of power into the battery and run the fan and the heater and the lights. So their whole job is to run the fan, the heater and the lights, and they use the internal regulator because it's just quicker that way when you're building bazillion cars, and that's how, where'd that little red guy? That's how factory mounted alternators come, internal regulator. We're obviously using external regulator and we'll cover a bit why uh, later on. Every alternator is gonna have a diode pack. You may hear at times something called a diode trio. They're not common, but some alternators use them. That's an independent diode pack that's very much smaller that feeds into the regulator. Can anybody guess why you would have an independent diode pack feeding into the regulator? I'm not trying to bait you, I'm just trying to engage you and wake you up a bit. <laughs> the reason why is every time you run current through something, you're going to get a voltage drop. And it's always, not always, never use absolutes. It is almost always going to be, that voltage drop will almost always be dependent on the amount of current you run through it. Diode pack's no different. The voltage regular uses this diode trio independent in order to sense battery voltage senses the battery voltage inside the alternator. And by using a diode trio, you don't have the variable aspect if you're putting out 10 amps or 110 amps interfering with that ability to sense. That's why a diode trio exists. So if you ever are modifying alternators and you hear this thing diode trio, you will probably be one of the smartest people in the room unless you happen to go and find a competent alternator shop with a guy that has hair colored like me, they'll know why it's there, okay? Um, one very critical aspect of alternators that I want to talk about is um, <coughs> the data sheets. Now, we talked about the data sheets, <coughs> liar papers, we talked about the data sheets before, right? You have to understand what data is being presented on the alternator. Most alternators will be sold as voltage and current. That current delivered will either be obtained only at a high point or never realistically attainable. The reality is alternators have a function of their RPM that we talked about already, but also their temperature. As alternators heat up, resistance increases, and it means that losses inside the alternator itself is going to reduce the output. So this is where the data sheets are really important. And a lot of companies either won't publish these or they'll publish them and not tell you what the temperature curve is. Or you can get quality alternators that will actually tell you what the parameters are that they measured under. So here's an example of an alternator that is sold as a 130 amp alternator. Uh, actually, I'm not, sure, so I'm not sure they call it 130. It's their 130 series. I have to admit, I'm not sure what they, they spec this alternator at, I have to admit. But at cold, when you first start that alternator up, it can produce, and you wing it really fast, it can produce almost 120 amps. But that's not real world. Within a few minutes, that alternator is going to warm up, and you're going to be down to well under 100 amps. So this will come back a little bit later when we talk about the value of the wake speed. As alternators heat up, their ability to produce amperage declines, and they can decline dramatically. The other aspect is how fast you spin them. So when you're sourcing alternators, you want to understand this. You want to know heat is the enemy. You want to know what the alternator is actually going to produce in the real world, and especially the worst case examples we've ever ran into are sailboats, because sailors hate 
their iron jib. There's just no one out there that has any love for it, so they stuff it in a little small closet. You know, it's really hot, it's cold, it's miserable inside there. That's going to really be an issue. So make sure you look at what the warm, hot temperature output of the alternator is. The other thing you're going to want to look for is what its output is at lower RPMs. Uh, if you have somebody that's looking to do recharging of batteries while at anchor, just doing a high idle, you need to make sure you get an alternator that has good output at lower RPMs. So <clears throat> I will clue you in. This is a 48 volt alternator. One of the Achilles heels of 48 volt alternators is they have lesser output at lower RPMs. You have to spin them faster. The entire industry is working on it. We have a couple of uh, strong partners. We know they're continuing making improvements, but as you're going through trying to figure out how to design your system, just be aware of that. The 40 volt alternators typically today, that's probably their biggest Achilles heel. Yes, sir. Well, on that specific topic, um, not that I've been exposed to or encountered the request of 40 volt alternators, but um, is the primary strategy for that belt and pulley ratios? Yes. Uh, that is, I'm really glad they brought that up. So the answer to this is you do your belt and pulley ratio and you want to have the alternator spinning. I'm not sure if this thing's rated 8500, I'm not sure I'd try to have it spinning all the way up there. But you want to have it spinning where it's moving fast. That's where the alternator is going to be its most efficient. It's going to have its best cooling. You're going to get the most power out of the alternator. Basically, analogous to the power curve, the internal combustion. It is. Yeah. And then on thermal management, that's a wild card because it, we all know in a marine engine room, mm -hmm. it can be adequately ventilated, rarely, but if it's well engineered, sure. It can have active, uh, you know, ventilation. It can mm -hmm. have passive ventilation. It can have totally inadequate ventilation where the ambient temperature of the air that the fan that the alternator is turning to cool itself is too high for it to really do it. A lot of variables, absolutely. A lot of variables. And, uh, yep. I was going to save this for tomorrow, for the end of tomorrow, but I'll go ahead and give this account. Uh, one of, we got asked the question earlier, what is the, what makes wake speed different? One of the differences is the wake speed regulates alternator temperature. We don't wait for it to go over its limit and cut back. We'll actually do that. That's like our second or third step. But at first, we try to regulate it. Customer claim from, I forget if it was South Pacific or Southeast Asia, hot, humid area. What's wrong with this wake speed regulator? My 160 amp alternator is only putting out 48 amps. I need a new regulator. This thing's broke. Well, and this is where, this is why it's going to be tomorrow, because we're going to talk about things you're going to find going on in, in bump in the night and how to address them. We have them capture a log file. Another value of the wake speed, we can produce log files. We looked at how that system was behaving. It was rising one degree every two seconds. Because the wake speed is an active regulator, we recognize that the rate of change, the DT, DT, delta temperature over delta time, was excessive. We started backing off. We took our foot off the gas on that alternator when it was at 65 degrees C. It was set for 120, we did overshoot. We went to 121 degrees, and then we lay it out at 120, and we could produce 48 amps under those conditions. So what was wrong with the wake speed regulator in that particular case is we kept you from burning up your alternator. That's what it was. The solution, they moved their engineer intake hose a little bit more toward the alternator to get a little bit more cooling. Now, of course, you gotta be careful with that, you know, the engine compartment vent hose, you have to be careful that, especially in a marine environment, you don't want salt air blowing straight on things, but it was a lack of cooling. And the wake speed regulator did what it was supposed to do. It kept it from burning up. Have, have you ever seen that film that uh, Victron has made about burning up an alternator? Well, you might be able to see it. They, they take an alternator with, uh, you know, there's some, <clears throat> I think I told you I finished my career in marketing. So trust me, I get about this, but I also have a technical background. 
There is some sleight of hand going on in, in a lot of those videos you see. None that will come out of Dragonfly, by the way. We were all straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> and no time did my fingers leave my hand, right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a joke. And in the marine world, we see this more in the marine world than anywhere else, and especially on sailboats, because there's just chronic poor ventilation in the engine room, and those poor little alternators are just being, being hammered. So another thing, and again, Rick's the smarter guy on the spinning rust, uh, different alternators have different ability to cool. There's multiple fans. There's uh, all sorts of kind of fun, interesting things, okay? Any other questions on alternators? Yes, sir. Yeah, like where does wake speed get temp gets its temperature reading from? Does that like a, a separate external we do. temp sensor? Or, okay. We do. So it doesn't rely on whatever sort of stock. All your harnesses, for the alternator, all your harnesses will come with the temperature sensor, and you want to mount it somewhere on the alternator. Okay. Well, we'll cover this a bit. If that's, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it now. Um, in alternators, the most vulnerable as, uh, component is the diode pack. So our experience is get the, the temperature sensor closest to the diode pack as you can. I personally, on my personal vessel, I've got a Leesonville 4800 series alternator that's like 35 pounds, it's a J1A mount, and the diode pack's right there on the back. I mount my temperature sensor on the diode pack itself. I see, so is that what burns out when people say an alternator burns out? It's a diode pack that burns out? Or? Typically, yeah. Typically, yes. That is the most vulnerable part of an alternator, absolutely. Um, they'll get worried about the coils getting hot, but the varnish on the coils are very, very high rated and stuff. Yes, sir, I saw. So can you actually put it on the battery, uh, on the alternator output on the top? That's the second best. If you can't get the diode on the diode pack yourself, like this one, you can't. Well, you actually can because this one got the plastic decorative cover got damaged in shipping. And, you know, that's actually the diodes there, but there's no way amount. So the next best place that we have found is place it on the positive output post. So put your heavy current cable and then stack the alternator temperature sensor and then stack your nut. That's the second best place to get to the diode pack. But no, in that case, that heavy copper wire is pulling some of the heat away. So you might want to derate the temperature setting a couple degrees to account for that. That's all configurable inside. Absolutely, it's all configurable. Now, there is one significant delta to this, and, and this is Balmer. And I'm not, you know, Balmer's a great company. They did some very wonderful things. Uh, their technology just, yeah, anyway, Balmer's a great company. We, we actually recommend Balmer alternators a ton because, uh, <clears throat> One of the issues that we often happen is when people try to take engine mount alternators and convert them for external use and try to drive battery banks, that often is problematic. So by just saying buy a Balmar, I don't have to deal with that. I know it's going to work. Uh, but the Balmar, and this is something you need to know, if you look at the, Balmar often has on their case a boss, a little screw where you mount the temperature sensor. And then if you go and study the data sheets from Balmar, at least when I study them, it says 83 degrees C. So when we configure for Balmar alternators, we specify 83 degrees C. This point is halfway between the diode pack and the stator, right? So it's picking a little bit of the best of the world's, and it's a consistent way across their whole product line. So just be aware of that. Uh, there's a direct relationship between where you mount the temperature sensor, and what temperature point you set it for. The stator, by the way, that big guy I was talking about, it's got an exposed stator. That thing, the alternator itself, I run the diode pack at 95 degrees C. I think they're rated for 120, 115. The stator itself will often go to 180. Yeah, you can see a 100 degrees difference between the stator stack and the rectifier. Yeah, and we have consulted with Presto Light on this. They're not alarmed. They say, that's what it does, that's what it's made for. Uh, we did that because a lot of customers, not a lot, I mean, they're really inquisitive customers. They were noting the different temperatures and saying, oh man, that's so hot, that's too hot. Manufacturers don't specify what that temperature should be. Um, I'm not gonna share all of that email, but we had direct engineering to engineering relationship and it's not an issue. The alternators are designed for that. So bottom line, yes, where you place the temperature sensor matters, 
and how you configure the regulator is dependent upon where you place the temperature sensor. Okay? All right. I want to talk, and we're going to come back to alternators as we go through this, because that's obviously an important part of this, but just wanted to make sure we covered a lot of the basics. Um, I want to talk about some of the systems approaches. <clears throat> You're going to hear us over the next day or two talking about these high energy systems. And you know what? It's not for everyone. Um, there are a bazillion ways to hook up a boat. I mean, if you go, if you go way, way, way back, you know, you had the starter battery and a diode-based diode, -based diode you know, splitter and the house battery. And maybe it was a couple of group 31s or a couple of golf cart batteries. I don't know. Those are perfectly fine if it satisfies the needs of the customers, right? In the world we live in, this is my recommendation. This is how I categorize stuff after I've asked a customer, how are you using your boat? The simplest and easiest, leave the factory alternator in and don't change it. Have it connected up to the starter battery and get a DC or DC converter. Victron makes like wonderful ones, 20 amp ones, they cost 180 bucks. Get a DC to DC converter, configure it for the needs of the house battery, and it'll charge the house battery appropriately. And I think that is a very, very appropriate install for like 20 to 30 amps. So we're talking 500 watt generating power transfer capability, right? There are other approaches. Yes, ma'am. What is the DC to DC uh, converter charging? Uh, the house battery. And what's charging the starter battery? The factory. Yeah, you make no changes to the engine. You don't change the alternator, you don't change the starter battery, you touch nothing. You get that little Victron DC to DC converter, you put the input to the starter battery, you put the output to the house battery, and there's an enable wire that goes up to the key switch. Now there are other ways that people do. They used to use relays, they used to use uh, FET, they used to use diodes, they used to use all sorts of stuff. I don't particularly like those. And here's why. Having a DC to DC converter that is configured for the needs of the house battery. And the charging needs of a house battery is dramatically different than the charging needs of the starter battery, which we'll cover in a bit. Having a DC to DC converter that can do what the battery needs, the house battery needs, totally independent of what's happening on the starter side is the right answer. And these things are only 200 bucks. Don't go spend 150 bucks that's going to force the house battery to be treated just like a starter battery. That's the wrong answer. Spend the extra 50 bucks, have a simple, reliable system. Absolutely perfect for two, 300 watts. I saw a question back there. Yeah, on top of that, you can have two different types of batteries that way. Yeah. And charge them correctly. Exactly, exactly. Yes, sir. I just want to clarify again, this is a low amperage system. This is a low amperage system. This is like a sailboat that is being used on weekends to go sail. This is a low amperage system. It's going to be needing a lot of power. I just want to make that distinction. Yep, 20 amps. You're going to hear me flipping back and forth between watts and amps. I know the boat industry stays with amps. You're going to see over the next five, 10 years of migration toward watts. So I'll, I'll try to use both terms. But yeah, this is a 20 amp solution. You can do this with a 200 amp, 250 amp DC to DC converter. Wake Speed offered the product called the Wake Speed 3000. 280 amp DC to DC converter. We deploy those on like Ford trucks that had twin factory 280 amp alternators and a 48 volt battery. You can definitely do that. And there was reasons for doing that. But if you're going to go and buy 4K watts of alternator head and spend a lot of money on it and then buy another 3 or 4K watt DC to DC converter. Why? Why not just have the alternator heads talk straight to the battery? So I don't believe this architecture scales, my personal opinion. I think it is brilliant for entry level systems. Yes, sir. If you're doing 200 to 300 amp hours, if you've got a couple of group 31s for your house bank, you know, you've got a 60 amp alternator on the engine, that's a perfect solution. Yeah, just, just throw it in your eye and you're good to go. So, 
to Kevin's point, mm -hmm. could you put a in camps cap on what this? 20 amps. 20. 20 amps. Victron makes, what's the name of it? Orion. Oh, Orion 20. You're talking about the <coughs> rating of the DC to DC? Correct. Burger. Correct. That was something I'm not familiar with. I, I mistakenly. Yeah. No, I'm glad you asked. Because I, you know, no. I know like a 1 GM Yanmar comes with a 35 amp. Right. Yeah. 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 Make sure you're not overloading. I don't know what the spec on that little guy is. I. Okay, I might not put a 20 amp DC DC here. I might put a 10 amp okay. on it, right? Um, but this is for getting 20 amps or so to the house battery. 12, 12 volt amps, right? 12 times 20 is 240 watts. So 200 watts to the battery, right? If you want to go up the food chain to something higher, turn it around. And this is probably the most, this is a very common deployment we have with wake speed. You swap out the factory alternator with something more capable. And you connect this alternator to the house battery. You don't have the alternator charging the starter battery like this guy did. You have this alternator charging the house battery. And then you use one of those Orion 20 amp to convert from house battery voltage down to the starter battery. This works really good in the marine world. The starter battery requirements in the marine install is typically very, very modest. The chassis loads, as we call them. This does not work well in the RV world because the chassis loads in RVs these days are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 amps. So now you're in that same space of buying a big alternator and a big DC DC converter, and you're just like spending twice for the same amount you know, for the same thing. But for marine installs, this second approach is probably the single most common one we see in anything but very high-end systems, where you replace the engine alternator with a more capable alternator, you control it with a wake speed regulator to charge the house battery, and then use an Orion DC to DC converter to go back and charge the, uh, the starter battery, okay? The next step up, and this is actually the one I prefer. This is what I've done on my personal vessel. You leave the factory system untouched. Factory alternator stays in place, factory starter battery stays in place, factory starter wiring stays in place, yet don't touch it. You then add a second alternator, dedicated to the house, with the appropriate regulator to make sure the house battery is being charged as it should be. I like this system for a couple of reasons. One, remember, we can't just step out of our vessels when things go sideways. I have a level of redundancy. These factory alternators, there are a bazillion of these things made. They are largely dead reliable. If you don't mess with them and you let them do what they were made to do, which is to charge a starter battery and carry chassis loads, you really is tough to, you can't improve upon these things. It lets me have a totally separate DC system. My personal vessel, I use a 12 volt house battery bank. And what I did is, you know those battery AB switches they have? I turned it around and I connected one side to the starter battery, one side to the house battery, and the output goes to my nav panel. I have segregated uh, DC sub panels. One panel is my nav, that's where my radio, radar, autopilot is, that's through that AB switch. My house sub panel is directly wired into the house battery. But by having that AB switch, it lets me run my nav electronics normally off the house battery. If something goes sideways with that, I can switch it over and run it off the starter system. And it'll be more than capable of doing it. And it also gives me a built-in uh, jumper by putting it into the both position. My personal preference is to do this in the marine world. The only time you wouldn't do it is if you don't have the room or the ability to add a secondary alternator. Is there any questions about these kind of three fundamental steps? Yes, ma'am. Would you review just one more time what you were talking about when you say chassis load? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a, if you have a uh, in the marine world, most in, uh, marine engines, all they do with the 
chassis load is they're running the instrument and gauges on the engine. If they have an electronic controlled uh, engine, then it's running that. That's why the chassis loads, the chassis loads on the marine system are very modest, maybe five amps, right? Um, on a car, you've got all that plus you've got the lights and the radios and the power steering and the fans and everything else. Now, on our boats, we usually move those things over to the house. You can't do that on uh, an RV. Okay. Another thing you can't do on an RV, increasingly, is replace the stock alternator. Today, car systems, the stock alternator is highly integrated with the engine ECU. It's part of the emissions, it's part of the mileage. You can't change it, you can't touch it. Some places you can't touch it because if you do, the check engine light will come on. Some places you can't touch it because if you do, people with blue lights are gonna show up and also ask if you rip that tag off of your mattress. It's illegal to mess with them, right? So there's a difference in the RV world. This kind of single alt approach, higher capacity will not work in the RV world for those reasons. Yes, sir? So along those lines, uh, do you find that adding a second alternator or swapping alternators ever voids uh, like warranties? <laughs> that is a really marvelous question, and the answer is it depends. Unfortunately, uh, engine manufacturers, their whole goal with warranties is to never pay money. So if they can find reasons not to pay money. Um, you know, in addition, kind of related to that question, is not just the alternator, but the mounting brackets and the belt kits. That's as hard of a problem for adding a secondary alternator as anything. I would suggest that particular question, if you have a concern, take it up with who you're buying the alternator from. So uh, again, we saw a lot of, you know, we recommend a lot of Balmars because they've got good products for the spinning rust and they've got a lot of the mounting brackets solved for the marine engines. If it's the RV world, we have two uh, large partners, American Power Systems and Nations Alternator. Um, you know, those guys have got the brackets and the kits and you can ask them about it. The answer is um, anytime you're calling somebody to write a check, um, they're going to try to find reasons not to. So. And you will get asked that question by, by, by some customers. I don't have a stock answer. I don't have a hard answer for you. Uh, it's just the reality of the world we live in. Good question, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, as we start eating up the food chain to get more generating capacity, one thing I haven't talked about is uh, I, I, I said that I consider high energy systems anything with a three or four kilowatt head or better. Um, in the 12 volt world, a 250 amp alternator is a pretty big alternator. And realistically delivering 200 to 200 and a quarter amps, that's a lot. That's at three kilowatts. And that's kind of the realistic upper side for um, the 12 volt world. I usually say uh, two kilowatts is the 12 volt world. Four kilowatts, you double the voltage, at the same amperage, you're going to get twice the, uh, the power out of it. So 4 k watts is kind of an upper, realistic upper limit for uh, 24 volts. By the way, that alternator that I talked about with the inch and three quarter inch shaft, I think that was a 20 k watt 12 volt alternator. It's like a ferry boat up in BC. Uh, so yeah, there are exceptions, but in the real world, you're, you're largely limited to around 150 to 200 amps out of an alternator. And then the wattage is dependent on the voltage because watts equals volts times amps. So as you double the voltage, you can double the wattage. So 12 volts is 2 kilowatts, 24.4 is uh, 4 kilowatts, and the 48 volt is 8 kilowatts. Those are realistically easily achievable outputs from a given alternator head. Yes? <laughs> so I don't know if this is getting off the weight speed topic, but how, how are you? supposed to size, what's the proper sizing? How do you size an alternator? Perfect, no, uh, it's a great question. No, this is exactly why we're here and this is why you get to hear me ramble on for two days versus two hours, right? So remember early on I talked about high energy systems. You're gonna size your inverters based off the peak load. You're gonna size your batteries based off how long that customer wants to sit 
and not have to use potatoes and listen to a generator. And then you're going to size your alternator head off of how quickly you want to recharge it. Our 48 volt installs that we do a ton of, they are able to start those sprinter vans in the morning and do a fast idle for 20 minutes and they'll fully recharge the entire day's use on that battery. They've got an eight, nine kilowatt head. If your customer needs to get that battery charged quick and that's what they want to do, you want more generating capacity, okay? Now, another kind of secondary aspect that goes into that is what kind of ongoing loads are there while operating is specifically air conditioners. Air conditioners is the number one, the HVAC, electrically driven, takes a ton of wattage. So that will also determine how the minimum size of alternator head you want. So for example, coming back to these sprinter vans, right? If they're running an air conditioner and it's pulling three or four K watts through the air conditioner and you got an eight K watt head, you only got four K watts into your battery, it's going to double the time it takes to recharge that battery. So that's kind of the math you want to do. Here's the thing to think about, the three major components, right? You've got your loads, the inverters have to be sized to service those loads. You've got your gas tank, that's the battery. That's how long you'll be able to service those loads until you have to start putting more gas into it. And then you've got your alternators. That's going to tell you how quickly you can refill that gas tank with the little sub point that some of that is going to get to uh, diverted to ongoing loads. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. Yes, sir. Okay. To that point, and while we're still in dual alternator world, yeah. when we add a second alternator, the assumption is it will be correct brackets, mm -hmm. correct belt pulley ratio, correct alignment of yep. things. Everything's gotten to I standard. Could you speak a little bit about how not to fall into the hole of uh, taking all the data into consideration, the use pattern, the loads, everything, and now you've arrived at a second alternator uh, optimal mm -hmm. output. Now let's look at the driver and say, well, I've got a, you know, a 35 horse Yanmar yeah. with this boat, yep. and I'm going to do a Balmar alternator, I'm going to do a weight speed regulator, I'm going to do their belt and pulley kit, all mm -hmm. the ratios are already figured out for me, it's great, they mm -hmm. did the hard work. Um, speak a little bit about what the upper limit of the, the load, the additional load, on the engine and the fuel economy and, you know, the horsepower sure. that consumes to <clears throat> add that second alternator. Yeah. So there are, as in many cases, not a single answer to any question. In this particular case, because we're talking about large capacity alternators, 3 kilowatts and above. So um, I think if you do the math with efficiency, you'll draw one horsepower for every 400 watts of energy produced. So if you've got a 4K watt being produced, you're pulling 10 horsepower out of the engine. That could be crippling. Exactly. Wake Speed has a solution for it. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Um, the other aspect is when you're trying to pull 10 horsepower up through that belt, is the belt up to it? Well, the old rule of thumb, right, with the V belts is one V belt was good for 100 amps. Right, so that's a thousand watts, right? So if you're doing 4,000 watts, guess what? You need four V-belts. Well, no one's using V-belts anymore. This particular guy has a V-belt on, uh, on it because to be honest, my primary test bench has a V-belt motor on. But that's why everyone's going to the rib belts. And Rick, do you have any insight as to what to consider when picking rib belts in terms of their ability to hold power? You know, I don't know that there's a lot of data out there in terms of what horsepower loads you know the the serpentine belts are gonna gonna address. But we, you know, just from from life experience, uh, a six group uh, six group serpentine, which you know typically Yanmar is gonna have one installed you know from the factory that, that they're very comfortable with about a 200 amp alternator. Right. Um, you yeah, know, I I've heard the, the biggest, the widest, like. I have a Dodge Ram. Yeah. The mm -hmm. Cummins 5.9. It's 310 horsepower. And it's not tweaked or anything, just factory. I replaced the alternator and it had a, it had a 
eight grooves. Mm -hmm. So about an inch and an eighth wide belt. Yeah. Belt. Um, if most of the most of the, the uh, accessory brackets that are out there, the belt, whether they're Belmar brackets or, or you know Grasser or whatever, um, most of those are coming with either a, an eight groove or a ten groove stirrup. Which you know I would feel pretty comfortable putting a you know putting one of the three hundred amp uh, like an APS or, or a Nations alternator. I think that would be you know more more than satisfactory. Yeah. And I'll just share. Yeah. Go ahead. Experience. Mm -hmm. I installed my first Belmar uh, conversion belt and pulley kit yes. on a small hand monitor, like a, I think it was a <clears throat> 20 horse. Anyway, um, I did the, it had the stock Hitachi 35 amp on it, but I put that kit on there because it was experiencing chronic Delaware, not just from misalignment, but rust and you know, brain. Sure. So I said, hey, you know, for a few hundred bucks, we can do this. And about belt maintenance almost entirely. And what I learned was that in the kit, even though it was specified for my application of the MR from Belmar, the belt was too long for the swing mile. I couldn't I couldn't use the belt that came in the kit. So it tripped in that belt. No, well <laughs> yes, yes, but and that's that's the relevant piece. Uh, all six groove belts we'll say are not created equal They're and not. i actually had to get all the belmar and to their credit they sent me the right belt and they credited me the one i sent back to them when they got it but i couldn't just go to the auto parts store and get a belt that had the same yeah a uh, groove profile a grip profile as the pulleys in the, in the belt market so it was very specific to the pulley no, I understand that. In, in, the, in the V belt world, we talk about A and B size belts. In the multi rib, J and K are common ones. Um, some of the third party kits, and I believe Balmar might be one of them, use a rib profile that's not commonly used in the automotive industry. The J profile is an industrial profile. Yeah. The K is, is an automotive profile. Um, so you have to go look in different places if yeah. you're trying to find an alternative source sure. for, for the, you know, the Balmar yeah. belts. Typically you'd go to Granger or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I figured since they sold me a kit, no, I presumed by application to fit my application that the belt should You would hope, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and I think you really bring a good point. You know, we're spending a ton of time talking about the alternators and alternator characteristics. Um, when we get into the world of the mount and the kits, it's just unbelievably complex. Balmar has a ton of history and experience in the marine world. Nations and APS have a ton of experience in, in the uh, uh, transportation world, the road world. When we get asked, because people will say, well, can I just go and buy this alternator? I'll say, well, yeah, you can, but how are you going to mount it? Right. They have no clue. So the kit is probably as difficult, if not more difficult of an issue. So those are kind of why we settle in on those three primary uh, sources, right? Um, the other thing that I'll comment on, uh, you asked about how do you know if it's a, sufficient. I think our experience is the reason they've gone away from V-belts to the multi rib. There's a lot of reason for it. One is they'll definitely do more power. We routinely see 8 kilowatt heads, 9, 10 kilowatt continuous duty with a multi rib secondary alternator in, in, in the uh, motor world. So those belts are definitely capable to it. If you have any questions, ask who you're buying these from. Yes, sir. There's also another limitation, especially on smaller engines, that's the side load on the crankshaft. Yeah, yep. Uh, side load on the crankshaft um, and not just actual side load. Do you know what we're talking about when we say that? Okay. Um, you know, not just the actual side load, but the warranty. So some of these engine manufacturers get kind of uh, pissy about doing side loads. Uh, we have had some people they'll put when they mount yeah, we haven't got, even gotten to this bullet. Man, I'll tell you what, this is the best slide of the whole deck so far, right? Um, when you mount dual alternators, you mount them on both sides of the engine so that you kind of equalize that side load. You don't have it. Um, some engine manufacturers will use it as a way, I think, well, I'm not going to say names. I have a name I have, but I'm not sure if they're the right one. Uh, but some engine manufacturers will use it as a way to void warranty. I don't know if 
Do you know who we're talking about? Volvo. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. So Volvo gets kind of annoyed. Uh, yeah. uh, Mercedes Benz, they say you can't put more than an 80 amp alternator on their engine for a variety of reasons. So every engine manufacturer talks about that, and it's, it's all risk reduction. In the real world, if it's done correctly, it's not an issue. And if there is a concern, uh, you don't use two. Or if you really have a massive concern, like this big giant alternator I keep coming back to, uh, what they did is they actually had a jack shaft and a pillow block. So there was no side load at all uh, on that. Uh, multi alternators, this is the next step up the curve. And um, this would be, for example, this would be, for example, oh, I'm sorry, yes. So if the limiting factor is current on an alternator, can you just make these voltage and then use something like an Orion to step down? Well, you can, but why? Why not? Well, if, if they're saying, like, you can have a max, you know, if, that, if Mercedes says you can have a max 80 amps. Oh, I'm sorry. They say 80 amps at 12 volts. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, they're onto that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're clever people. They're going to say, oh, no, no. You may. <laughs> that's, that's not allowable. No. I, I bring that up because we're, you guys are going to have to design these systems. And you're going to get customers asking these questions. And the reality is there's no answer. You cannot install a higher energy system on a Mercedes-Benz and meet the requirements. You just can't. The other reality is we have tens of thousands of them out there running with six to eight kilowatt heads. And the side load or the engine load is not the issue. There are other aspects there are issues that you know, we can cover a bit. But it's just, you know, people, companies want to reduce risk. And the easy, the easy, if you've ever had a kid you know the easiest thing to do is say no. Because they don't have to think about anything. No, don't have to think anything. Walk off, it's like, well, great. That was nice. <laughs> right? So that's just the reality. Yeah. But no, don't, don't go down and over complex your design by trying to get around something like that. You know, think of a different way to have a high quality install without adding extra components and extra cost and extra failure modes. Right. Uh, I let me look real quick here. Uh, let me go through this very next slide because I think this will go quick, and then we can do our break. How's that sound? So, um, alternator purchasing considerations. Uh, I think we've actually talked about almost every one of these topics. Uh, voltage amperage, mounting of the belts, the largest challenge. Regulation, internal versus external. My opinion, the starter battery, don't mess with the internal regulator because they're the best in the world. Uh, if you're doing a house battery, internal regulators are the absolute wrong choice. You need an uh, uh, re external regulator. There's something called P versus N. Do you guys know what that is? It's how you excite the alternator. Um, if you, uh, when you have a field wire, if you apply a positive voltage to the field wire, that'll excite the alternator. That's, how you, that's the gas pedal with an N-type alternator, which we don't see much here in the US, uh, master volt or N-type, some European or N-type. When you ground that field wire, that's how you excite the alternator. Inside there, what they actually physically do on the P-type is one end's connected to the ground and you apply a positive voltage here. With an N-type, they put one end tied to the power output on the alternator and you end up grounding this. That's the difference. Sometimes it's called A and B. Uh, you'll see those nomenclatures as well. You're going to get these. Uh, slides so you'll be able to go back and refer to these at some point. Um, we've talked about be wary of uh, uh, data sheets and marketing. My partner calls it more hat than saddle. Beware of that. Um, also we have had horrid experience with very few exceptions of taking a stock factory alternator that was designed to charge to do a starter battery loads and converting it for house battery. Rick has actually one alternator that he likes Wait, and which one is that that you say is actually pretty good? Is it the Valeo or? Uh, yeah, the Valeo that comes Valeo. standard on, on you know, most of the Yanmar systems. It's actually very easy to modify. Um, Balmar actually makes a kit where you can just you know, yank. Uh, it, it comes with the, the regulator and brush holder are all one module. It pops out, you pop it, and new one, it's three screws, and you're ready to go. It's, it's pretty cool. And it's a good, robust 
alternator. You have that 120, 125 amp value of alternators. A good, you know, a good alternator. You know, particularly if you're kind of in that, you know, 400 to 600 amp power. Yeah. So that's probably the sole exception that we're aware of that's been pretty successful converting stock alternators to the, you know to uh, external use. Uh, we have people who will take old school you know alternators. They'll take them to an alternator shop. 90% of which don't know what they're doing unless they got somebody who looks like me in the back room. Uh, just be really, really wary of any uh, alternator converted stuff. Okay. Um, the last thing to talk about, and we've already covered this here, is uh, sizing, sizing your system. We talked about how to size your inverters, your batteries, your alternators. We talked about the trade-off. Um, of the voltages. Remember your wire sizes as well. You want to keep those all, all in line and those are all amperage based. So one of the cool things about going up to higher system voltage is the wire size that can go down because you carry the same amount of power with a smaller wire. Um, there is, you might want to know why 48 volts gets talked about. There is actually legal definitions for ultra low voltage and it's 60 volts in the US and 75 volts in the EU. These are written into laws. When Rick and I, as Thomas and Jones, went and got our business liability insurance, we were only covered with ultra low voltage. It is a legal definition, and if you go above that, you have additional requirements, you have additional liabilities. In the automotive world, 400 volts, actually 800 volts is most common these days. Anytime you're looking at a car and see something orange, just back away and leave it alone. But that's why you're seeing these high energy systems go to 48 volts. Uh, and that's probably why they'll stay there, because to be frank, the volume is rather modest compared to the rest of the world. We can accomplish what we need with 48 volts and don't need to go. All right, that's all I have on this. We'll take our break and then talk about batteries. <laughs>